Welcome everyone to the Future Climate for Africa webinar entitled City Learning Labs for Dialogue and Decision Making. My name is Suzanne Carter and I'm the head of the FCFA Capacity Coordination Ex Knowledge Exchange Unit at South South North and I'll be covering the general housekeeping for this webinar. Our panelists today will be presenting a series of presentations and our host Bettina Krola will be keeping them to time. There will be a few opportunities to answer questions, so please feel free to put your questions into the Q&A box that you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom webinar interface. There's a button that's labeled Q&A. Please click on that and note which of the particular panelists you would like to address the question, and we will be taking the questions periodically throughout the webinar. Uh, we will aim to answer as many of these questions as possible in the allotted time, but any questions that can't be answered live will then be answered in writing following the event. The webinar is also being recorded and will be shared on the FCFA YouTube channel. So please consider sharing it with anyone you may know who would have liked to attend today but couldn't join for whatever reason. Uh, there will also be a short poll at the end of the webinar to get your feedback. I'll now hand over to Bettina. Great, right, thank you so much. And uh, welcome to everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, we're going to give you a couple of uh, impressions really about the City Learning Lab process and how this process was used for dialogue and decision making, specifically integrating climate information into decision making spaces and urban spaces in Southern Africa. I'm joined by my colleagues who have been part of the City Learning Lab journey and who have been taking great risks in this journey and I really appreciate uh, them for it uh, very much. Um, it's uh, Gilbert Siame from the University of Zambia who I think will hopefully join, be joining us still. Richard Jones from the UK Met Office and Chris Jack from CSAC, the University of Cape Town. So with this, I think I would like to give you a little insight on what are city learning labs and what is it that we're actually talking about when we talk about city learning labs. Next slide, please. So in Fractal, we looked at um, how we can really think about making decision making, decision taking on city level more robust and how we can actually make sure that cities are not just dealing with immediate need and immediate pressures, but that they can also include sort of midterm and long-term climate scenarios to really understand risk to long-term decisions that they're taking on city level. So you can see we've worked with a number of cities in Southern Africa. And I think what I would like to say is it is really around exploring a challenge on city level. And uh, that happened in all these cities. Some of these cities had a more intensive uh, process than others. And we'll be um, sharing quite a lot of examples from Lusaka. Um, it is about a multi-stakeholder dialogue and it is really around turning things upside down. Instead of us saying, this is the climate information we think you should be considering, we are saying, tell us what you think the challenges are that are lying ahead. And we can together figure out what climate information might help you in taking more robust and more long-term sustainable decisions. Um, and an important aspect you can see here also is city to city learning. It created a lot of enthusiasm and generated a lot of insights. Um, and this is something I think we're often not necessarily um, considering so much. Next slide, please. So on city level, we're often dealing with a lot of very immediate pressures. We're dealing with uh, tensions. We're dealing with lots of challenges. We're dealing with also a, a huge number of stakeholders that are engaged in these challenges. So this is the situation that we started and climate change obviously is not necessarily your first port of call or your first port of concern for government officials when they're allocating budgets, when they're discussing policies and when they're discussing, discussing emergency strategies. Next slide, please. So city learning labs are basically an approach that is an iterative learning approach. For those of you who are familiar with um, extra research processes, it is a participatory extra research process where the participants themselves guide the process. So it is not an external facilitator who will work out curriculum and decide what's going to happen next, but the group gets together, 
decides where they would like to focus on a burning issue in the city, pick one, then say, who is it that we need to be talking to? Who should be joining this process? Who has knowledge that is important in this aspect? And it's not just academic knowledge, it's all types of knowledge. And then the, the group will then, through an iterative learning process, explore the system's perspective, explore different aspects of the problem, of the system, of possible solutions, of policy responses, then together decide on what needs to be further explored or what action can be taken. And this is an iterative process over some time. So a city learning lab approach is one that is a learning journey. It's not a once-off event. And it is, in the end, finally concluded by the participants themselves who say, we have explored this, we have taken some action, or we decided we couldn't take any action, and we are now either focusing on another issue or we are concluding this process here. Next slide, please. So here are some principles of the city learning approach. Next, please. It's very much an adult-adult conversation. It is a conversation between peers. It is also a conversation that will happen as an iterative learning process. So it is something where we reflect, we go back to it and we move forward. It is quite importantly a process and not a project. We're not talking about fractal as the project when we work as a part of the city learning lab, but much more it is a learning process where within this process, we are exploring and unpacking issues as equal partners and us as facilitators are the enabling partner, but we have not more or less power than other participants. So it is really important to, to see this as a co-production process where every type of knowledge is important, is considered, is treated with respect and will be part of the bigger picture and hopefully also of the solution. Next, please. So it is about understanding and embracing complexity. It is not about reductionist focusing on one sector, on one issue, but it is about focusing on one issue, looking at the bigger picture, trying to understand it in its complexity. It's really an important process because it has, it is supported by a number of really important values. The process should engender trust, openness and respect. The process should be highly flexible and it should be a very safe space for the participants to be in and for the facilitators to be in, to be able to explore, to be able to take a risk. And I think it requires a lot of humility from all the participants and maybe especially from the facilitators and also sometimes especially from the policymakers and the academics. So it is very much focused on learning. It is a joint learning process. That's why it often creates, um, it often involves a lot of reflection. Um, to understand where we are in the process and to decide where we would like to go next. Next screen, please. So a learning lab process is really around crossing boundaries. It is talking to ministers at higher level breakfast, engaging with high level policy processes and engaging with people in informal settlements and their issues and really taking the levels of information, of knowledge, of contributions um, as equal value in this process. Next, please. It is also about generating enthusiasm. It is about creating a sense of belonging, a sense of uh, we are able to laugh about ourselves, maybe our predicaments, and this lightness of the process is not a frivolous lightness. It is a lightness that allows us to see things in a different way and hopefully stimulate some creativity to think about innovative solutions of the problems we are facing. Next slide. It is also about exploring complexity, exploring the systems and what does it mean? And often I think we, we have systems that are formal systems but then there are elements to these formal systems that are also really significant in terms of guiding processes and systems and how they work or don't work. So it is really important that we use the city learning lab processes to explore this complexity. Next slide, please. And it is about recognizing individuals and understanding that we're coming there as persons with our own feelings, fears, ambitions, um, sometimes agendas, and that we can 
be our own persons as well as our professional personas in these processes. Next slide, please. It is also about designing a process that is a little bit more than just a normal workshop process, but one that is potentially able to generate creativity, allowing people to take a risk, and that always has an element of something unexpected that makes people curious and wanting to engage in the process. Next, please. And last but not least, it is also quite significantly around reaching out to stakeholders, going there, making sure they feel invited so that they can be actually part of the process. It is not about making sure they get the invite. It is much more. It is about listening. It is about engaging. And I think we'll hear much more about this. Next slide. So here you can see a quick sketch of the fractal learning journey in Lusaka. You see there were a number of learning labs. The black cards are a reflection of what we thought was important in the process um, when looking back. And I think quite importantly, it is about creating a sense of community. Like you can see here, the learning lab group taking a selfie after visiting the hydropower plant um, near Lusaka. But it is most importantly around how we can create flexible minds, how we can really be flexible, understanding the complexity of the issues that are so dynamic to come up with robust solutions. Next slide. And with this, uh, I just wanted to give you a timeline of what happened in Lusaka. We started the first learning lab in 2016, where the burning issue was identified as water in peri-urban areas or informal settlements of Lusaka. We then had a second learning lab where we defined what our joint vision was and what the thematic areas were that we were trying to explore. We had a field trip associated with this. The third learning lab was focusing on thematic areas. We had another field trip looking at boreholes and also the water treatment plant. In 2018, then, we had a fourth learning lab looking at how to formulate policy briefs and some of the insights that were generated and how to have a deeper exploration on groundwater and water quality in the process. And in 2018, towards the end of 2018, we finalized the policy briefs. We explored um, flooding and water supply issues and governance issues and we closed this particular learning lab journey. Um, in between this were dotted a number of um, training events, policy dialogues, high level breakfasts, et cetera, as it was decided by the participants in the training, in, in the course of the learning lab journey. And so this is just to give you a bit of a sense of what uh, we have been working with. And I just want to make sure that uh, Gilbert has joined our team here. Um, Susanna, is Gilbert online? Yes, I, I am Gilbert. online. Fantastic. I'm very much online, except I'm having a challenge with technology. The sharing is only showing a very by small, small screen in the corner, and I'm starting to follow the diagrams and everything. Okay. But I've followed all the presentation from the beginning. Great. Right. Fantastic. Um, well, then next slide. And I think with this, uh, with this, I'll hand over to you, Gilbert. I hope the technology will work for you. This is one of the um, exercises we call the flexi flexi approach that when you do uh, city learning labs, mm. the unexpected will always happen. And when the unexpected happens, mm. then uh, you just go with the flow and uh, you enjoy this. Yeah. And Gilbert, I see uh, you're logged in under my name. I will change it. And um, over to you, Gilbert. All right. Thank you so much, Bettina. I appreciate the background and the wonderful outline of what has happened in the city of Lusaka and also generally what has characterized our, um, our uh, learning labs uh, in the Fractal project. Just to add a few points. Uh, first of all, I'm not sure uh, if the slides are being moved, as I'm only seeing Bettina's um, 
uh, profile picture. That's all. Yeah, yes, Gilbert, you just need slides. to let us know when you want us to move to the next slide. Okay, perfect. So I can go to I can go to my next slide. Have you made the movement? Yes, we have. We're on the presentation <laughs> outline. Yeah. It's not, it's not coming here, it's only your name, Suzanne Carter, which is coming, that's all. Okay. okay. I'm sorry for that, Gilbert. Can you just maybe look at the reference slide deck and your presentation outline at the moment? Yes, okay, that's fine. Um, let me continue. Apart from the points that uh, I'll flow with the flow, and I might reference my, mater my materials which are on the, on the same computer I'm using. If I cannot see on the screen you're sharing, but I'll be advising when to move. If I just add a few things which Bettina have mentioned, it's mentioned, it mentioned important points, just in addition to that, uh, in our labs, what we've realized and what we've learned is that um, uh, yes, trust is extremely important. You need to build trust. People need to have the confidence to listen and trust your statements, your ideas, and your opinions and your experiences, that's crucially important. The other aspect which is very important is to manage the whole setup. We all come from different backgrounds, different forms of power in our in those uh, social setups. And so the facilitator needs to be super careful to um, avoid one group or one person one night the next running goes ad is the issue of Gilbert. Um I'm not sure if everyone else can hear Gilbert really well. Uh, in terms of people and in terms of ideas and hold on. Hello. Sorry, Gilbert, you've been breaking up for about the last minute, so you might need to just go back a little bit. Hello. Uh, here, we can hear you again. I think perhaps we need to switch over and maybe Bettina and Richard could pick up the presentation. Okay, um, Gilbert, if you can hear us, um, maybe we'll just in true fractal style um, complement uh, the presentation and the slide deck that you have uh, prepared. And um, we'll, we'll see if you can um, maybe comment at the end. Okay, I'm coming back. Oh, now we hear you beautifully. You want to continue? Yes, now it's okay, clear. Even the, screen, even the screen is working perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, so um, I, was, um, I was just uh, emphasizing the point of diversity of ideas and the participants saying if we, we sort of succeeded in our labs because there was real diversity in the room and there was real diversity of ideas and there was respect for that. And um, we found that as an important ingredient in making uh, the labs really lived up, up to what they promise of allowing really heated conversations in terms of exploring the challenge and also exploring possible uh, action points or solutions or defining pathways for action. We found that uh, very important, moving from science to institutions and to society itself and then uh, getting back the same kind of, um, uh, kind of uh, uh, route or arrangement. Next slide, please. So uh, the challenge uh, that we found in the Fractal Project, um, and I'm refre reflecting a lot based on the Fractal Project and Fractal Activities in the city of Lusaka, is to move um, and make real of uh, what Chris Field uh, mentioned from the International Panel on Climate Change, that we know it's real, there is climate change, it's a reality, science is, has consens almost consensus about that. But the issue is how to move, get the information to support decision, good decision making, how to make decision climate sensitive, climate smart, 
that we found as a real gap that our project was seeking to achieve and Lusaka was indeed a, a very good site to experiment and uh, try to move from science to policy and vice versa. Uh, and really there is, is a debate which is well settled. We focusing on cities because of concentrated, you know, climate risk and a lot of poverty and a lot of things that are really, that really need action in order to transition to resilient urban futures. Next slide, please. Uh, Bettina defined what a learning lab is. You can just look at that uh, diagram. That's a depiction of some of the things that we are doing in the city of Lusaka, where uh, we had diversity of people. Uh, in that picture, you have people from Climate Change Secretariat, you have people from Directorate of Planning, City Council, you have academia from people doing climate work, climate science, and you have ordinary people from the communities, and you have uh, all various of groups. But the issue is not to get people in the room. The issue to get people in the room and get people interested, to cultivate energy and cultivate in the participants, the impetus for them to ask questions, to explore actively and to challenge ideas as we explore uh, you know, issues to understand them deeper and understand the drivers and explore solutions. So it's sort of a social setting that is driven by active participation and diversity of ideas and personality. Next step, please. It's uh, our lab in, the, in Lusaka, we basically focused on three, four uh, 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 objectives. The first one was for us to create a platform for iterative transdisciplinary co-exploration and co-production processes. Apart from explaining them, we also needed to understand these processes. What do they entail in practice? What do they involve? issues that Bettina mentioned, which I also mentioned, how does power trust, how do disciplinary perspectives and interests, how do people's comfort spaces play themselves in a social setup uh, happening in a form of a learning lab? How do people you know, uh, 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 you know, appreciate each other and one another's perspectives? And how can we really move towards some sort of uh, an agreement on how we, we can, we can uh, um, change the status quo, particularly on the development uh, discourses and processes uh, in southern cities, in, in, in southern in city, cities in, in, in southern Africa. Then the other aspect was how to en enhance knowledge on how to integrate climate information into decision making at city region scale. So apart from exploring and engaging with the climate questions, we are seeking to get our climate information into decision spaces. And therefore, in the labs, we have climate questions. We also have decision-making science questions. We have the gray space issues. We have urban informality issues. We have really, the, you know, questions on how cities function and how they how they perform. Then we also sought to create a platform for climate science decision-making, creating some sort of a bidirectional feedback. We have the science and we have the existing decision mechanisms as we seek to refine and improve both sides of our existence, the science and decision processes, how should the two feedback each other and how should the two challenge each other? That's the platform we are creating. Then we also explored with the idea of doing humble science. Sometimes science is so dominating, you have figures, you have graphs, you have you know, things that are being pushed there. And sort of people, they, they know, but how do we get the people to act? How can we make science humble and increase the wisdom of science so that it begins to resonate, begins to connect with people's everyday struggles? Remember, these cities have so many challenges and so many problems, and there are politics at play here. So how do we get the science humble enough for people who are so busy to actually begin to reflect and say, well, listen a bit, let's get the science in the room as well. So we sought to create such a platform where the scientists can also listen and wait before they can do their the, the modeling and say, look, as you seek to minimize flooding risk in the city of Lusaka, for example, this is also what you need to factor in in terms of temperatures and in terms of rainfall pattern and in terms of rainfall intensity going up to 2100. Then you begin to be seeing people taking a little bit of a deep breath and say, wow, as we look at infrastructure deficits, there's this angle of things that we need to factor in place. That is making increasing the wisdom of science, making it come in extremely handy and extremely you know, appropriate and not just flashing the figures. And it was okay, so it, it, temperatures will increase. 
I need to provide land for people to do their housing. But look, you need to meet the housing challenge in the context of a, this type of a future climate. Next, please. So these are some of the things, the immediate challenges that like we've been referring to. You can look, this is, these pictures are real and I took them myself in the city of Lusaka. You can see the Westy, you know, Westy challenge there. Just a, a minimal amount of rain for falling on the, on the city. This, this, this city will be flooded and it happens like that year in, year out. Maybe apart, even this year when we had drought, there are still spaces which she flooded. And these are the immediate issues that uh, our city officials are really pressed on to make a difference. And so when you overlay a climate question here, if you do not bring it in a smart way, it will be the last for consideration. But in our learning lab, these issues were raised and the climate question, the climate science also came on board. And we found the people really making a real connection between rainfall, droughts, and flooding and solid waste. We found that uh, we created a nice platform for various professionals and experts to connect and to make sense of the science, make sense of the social development, make sense of the decision that people make every day. So the lab was really a, a very useful platform. Next, please. And how did we do it? You can see the first time we met to really have our first lab, we were all exploring what is this lab all about? We had just read about it, but how do we design it? And uh, it was ex exciting and interesting because when we threw the idea sort of uh, an issue that was not so well defined, no one was really the leader, the climate science was there, the decision people, the political scientists, the urban planners, the land use uh, regulators, the energy people, everybody in the room. And there was no expert to step in and say, this is what I want us to do. We said we're exploring the development challenge of the city of Lusaka. What are the issues? that are pertinent now and in the next 40, uh, 10 to uh, 40 years. What are the issues? And people were free to explore. You have an engineer commenting on solid waste. You have a development planner commenting on the poverty in the city and how it interacts with the issues of uh, urban flooding. And we, we really discussed many, many issues in the room. And we came up, came up with four, three, uh, uh, four, important aspects, which we zeroed to one theme, water security for people in informal settlement. At that time, the, gra the graphs you are seeing, which were done by CISAC at UCT, uh, working under the, 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 the umbrella of Fractal, you, at that time, these figures were very far, these, gra these models were very far, they are not even there. In the second to third year, then we started getting, well, we've defined water security for people in informal settlements. What does that really mean? And how can we bring in the climate question? What can climate scientists do to help people in the city achieve this objective of ensuring a very resilient uh, Lusaka city with a particular intention of having people in formal settlements very water secure in terms of water supply, in terms of water quality, in terms of flooding, uh, risk minimization, and all that kind of stuff. And you can see, and I will not uh, speak what they mean because Chris is coming to talk about them. You can see they tell us about the temperature, they told us about the rainfall pattern up to about 2100s. But this came in after the scientists were well, well informed about what people really care about now and in the medium, medium to long term. What do they care about? And what are the dilemmas and challenges in getting to a future they desire? And how, they, how then can the climate science and climate output, the models and everything in that basket, how can they be, uh, support? What information do people need to be supported in order to make that type of a decision? Because we can have all this if we don't factor in the climate question. We don't know the intensity of rain, we don't know the intensity of droughts. Our design in terms of infrastructure, our land use processes, might actually miss the link and might actually miss the opportunity. So that towards making science come really last, making real sense of a humble science that is effective, penetrating and captivating in the minds of the participants. We can go to the next, please. And so there are substantives that were done during our labs. The one of the things is defining the issue and not from one perspective, but from multiple perspectives living in the true sense of core exploration, core design, core production, the true sense of those processes. And that's what we did in our first, second engagement labs. 
The second one is saying, wow, we have all these issues. They are a function or a product of decision making. So engaged with the decision making analysis and mapping of institutions and mapping really the actors and analyzing and begin to point where the power lies, where does the influence lie, who should make what decisions. That was an important component in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in our labs. The second one was to understand then, we would find the issue, we would find the governance dynamics. And then the next one is, what is the climate evidence now and in the future? And this is why we had the baselines, and this is why we had the, the, the projections coming very handy to begin to resonate with the decision-making process and systems, as well as the issues of significant importance in the now and in the future. Then after the, best, after the projections and the baselines, we went further to say, okay, so what about these baselines and the, and, and, and the, guide, and, and the, and the projections? We went to model now, again, in a true spirit of collaborative, transdisciplinary, uh, and co-generation process to generate, to come up with the climate risky impact scenarios, modeling the future under various climate scenarios, a higher rising temperature or constant temperatures or falling temperatures. The other aspect is increasing rainfall or increasing um, uh, uh, what I may call, because I'm not a climate science expert, maybe increasing disruptions in the rainfall pattern or increasing intensity or delayed onset of rainfall, which is a particular common thing for, for Zambia. Uh, uh, people related to independence, 24th of October, it's supposed to rain, but now it no longer does that. If it is going to rain starting in December and end in March, what does that mean? And we had various scenarios done by different, by all of us in the process. We are moving step by step, defining the issue, defining the, client, defining the issue, defining the governance, defining the, the baseline in terms of climate and then the so what question of the scenario based on the scenarios. Then above everything else, all this work that we've done, how can we contribute towards urban resilience and the climate adaptation risk management planning situations? And this is where our work has become extremely handy because right now all this type of work is feeding into the city's uh, integrated development planning, the city's uh, local area water security initiative planning active work funded by the city and the international partners, uh, getting the ideas that the, the lab generated in the process, you know, the lab generated and these ideas feeding into real life issues. Why? Even as Fracto is at that end of the, our phase one work, the impact still remains there and the people still on the process. Why? The lab design, facilitation, and the implementation processes allowed for ownership and appreciation of the process and the science in the labs. Next, please. And so you can see here from science to solution, I partly mentioned about this, we define the, the problems, we define the solution, we have done training workshops to, so that we move from sort of consensus that yes, we is going to get water in Lusaka and yes, then for no longer be as reliable as it has been in the past. It will take different forms of disruptions in our, in our rainfall pattern. So how should the city people, how should other decision makers and investment, government investment wings, how should they act? And this is where training came in. And this is where the embedded researcher became extremely handy, moving between the science and the policy space, really making sense and making real of what is being discussed in the lab and making tangible follow-ups and engagements and discussions. Then rather than just talk about Lusaka, we found exchange, which Bettina referenced, we found exchange, a very important ingredient in making people move from that social setting process where real science happens to actually engage with what other cities are doing. We went to Deben and I've seen Deben, we went to Deben and we found how Deben is actually improving uh, adaptation, you know, implementing adaptation efforts to one, fight, reduce poverty, and also improve environmental benefits in, in, uh, along river channels. And in the city here, there were discussions to actually put concrete on sites which were flooding. And we said, look, our friends are doing something a little bit better than what we are trying to do. We went to Namibia and we found a very water-stressed country and city, Vinduk, how they have um, 
implemented certain ideas to ensure water security and we drank water from, you know, reclaimed water from, from, from the sewer system. Something that is a taboo here and our, our engineer from the city of Lusaka was part of the, the, part of the delegation actually drank and said, yeah, tastes the same, tastes nice. And that debate, whenever we meet now, people say, yes, we must explore such kind of things, expensive as they may be, but they are happening in the region. That was because we are asking a question, how can we ensure a water secure Lusaka? Given that groundwater is increasingly under threat because of land use activities, and sometimes because of droughts, like right now, we've been in serious droughts, and I can tell you as I speak now, we have, 20, we have 12 hours of load shedding. And those 12 hours of load shedding is equal to the same 12 hours of no water supply in informal settlements. And I was there yesterday and I was just wondering, wow, this is what we've been talking about. So what are the other alternative sources of water that you can get? For sure, people always uh, generate waste and maybe that's an angle we can be looking at. And we got exposed to that. We got exposed to so many good practices around the city and we learned about the zero and what it means. And sometimes all these things sound very far, but the city of Cape Town became a reality. And they're saying, look, these things may not be very far-fetched. As we begin talking about water scarcity now, in the next two, three, four, ten years, we could be hitting similar uh, levels of crisis. And Bettina mentioned, we target, targeted decision makers, high-level breakfast up to ministers, so that from the lab, these ideas get out of the lab into some sort of implementation, some sort of very, you know, power spheres where people can work around and implement one or two things. And we understood and we still understand that a successful lab is largely dependent on very careful planning and careful implementation, careful facilitation with respect to what we mentioned on power, you know, managing, carefully managing power, managing diversity and appreciating difference. Next, please. I'm almost done. Yeah, and this last slide is basically um, emphasizing one point. We must map, and we did map, decision making and impact pathways by really getting down and talking to people who are on the coffers of some of the city uh, challenges induced by climate change and infrastructural deficits. And you can see a gentleman there having a very deep discussion from people who live and struggle in informal settlements where flooding, where water security is an everyday challenge. And when we get into the lab with these residents of our communities in the room, we are not speaking from mere science, but we are speaking from both science and critical urbanism, critical ideas that are shaping southern cities or cities in southern Africa and Lusaka being one of them. So we push the idea that science is a product of lived reality, and it must be as such, climate science, must be as such if it is going to really be not for the sake of intellectual development, but intellectual and policy development. It must be embedded in what actually happens in our spaces. Next, please. The last point is the ability to listen. If a lab is going to succeed, like in our case, we are very proud when we looked at what we've achieved and what is seeing the lasting legacy in the city of Lusaka. It is summarized in when you look at this picture, you look at the lady there and look at the gentleman there paying attention to one another. One of them is a senior academic, the other one is just a recent graduate working in the city. And here we are trying to map disaster prone, uh, flood prone areas in the city of Lusaka with the backdrop of the graphics or the models that um, climate scientists did in terms of the rainfall pattern going forward. And they're saying, where will be the highest risk for flooding? And here you see the conversation, people listening to one another quite, quite deeply. And this is what marked our, 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 our lab uh, in the city of Lusaka. Listening is an important art and being humble no matter how much we know, is also an important art. And science can make a much bigger impact in our view if it is approached from that angle. We get to challenge science itself and we get to challenge the policy itself. So it's a bi-directional direction, bi -direction impact that is built and dependent on 
reality, listening, humility, and the substantive issues, both intellectual climate, climate questions and development questions and development uh, decision-making and decision science questions. So this is what I had prepared. And uh, I think the next slide, slide must be a thank you. Next, please. Okay, Bettina, am I done? Thank I you, Gilbert. <clears throat> yes, excellent. And uh, we'll hand over to Richard for some reflections. Richard, from the U Richard Jones from the UK Met Office, <clears throat> giving us some reflections um, from your perspective, Richard, how how were these learning learning journeys, these learning um, labs? Over to you, Richard. Hey, thank you very much, Bettina. Um, thank you very much for everybody who's um, joined this. Um, <coughs> it's been a great honour and privilege to work with um, the Gilbert and uh, Chris and Bettina and the many, many people from Lusaka City who have been involved, as you've seen from... Um, um, from Gilbert's slides, and it's a similar honour and privilege to be able to um, talk about it um, to this um, FCFA audience. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to reflect a little bit on <clears throat> some of the um, things we've learned from these interactions that we've had, um, some of the, the good things that have happened, um, some of the uh, things which haven't gone so well, or some points which we um, <clears throat> uh, which were raised that. Um, we need to uh, um, take into account when we're involved in these processes um, <clears throat> and then to have a uh, just to think about some of the the sort of outcomes the impacts that this work um, uh, um, has had <clears throat> um, this as you will have seen from the presentations so far quite a lot of this is focused on Lusaka the the reason for this is because all, all four of the presenters um, today were part of the core team that was working in fact um, as part of the fractal project within Lusaka. Um, similar processes were happening in the other in the, um, the other cities, but because we were all uh, heavily involved in, in Lusaka, most of the um, uh, the material and the reflections comes from our experiences there. <clears throat> um, but the points I'll make uh, um, are quite general to to the process. Um, and quite a lot of the things that, that we learned and the stuff that um, things that, uh, that the Gilbert has, Bettina were, were talking about um, were, were quite evident right at the beginning of the process in the first learning lab as we as we navigated through the these relationships and these uh, um, the different the communities who were were were, were present in the room and. Um, and one of the things that was 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 really really important was that uh, <coughs> um, making it very clear at the beginning that we're bringing these these different um, actors, these different sort of different communities, people with different uh, our expertise, um, all together with um, to have a focus on issues that are, are relevant to to the city um, and it's it's the communities. So that's that's a key a key point um, to make clear at the. The, uh, um, at the outset. As part of that, and you've heard this already from, uh, from Gilbert and quite a lot of what I will be saying uh, has already been, um, <coughs> um, been reflected by Gilbert, is to enable all of the participants in the process to have a voice, but also to shape the uh, agenda and the process. Um, again, this was something that you heard from Bettina uh, um, at the beginning. Allowing space um, and, an, and in, in an environment to um, provide an in-depth analysis of issues <coughs> uh, was very important. Um, and that includes the ability to be critical of existing situations in terms of policies uh, um, and governance, but also recognizing that there's a lot of really positive work um, that is happening um, in in the in the cities, and that one of the things that we're there to do is to build on things which are, are already um, uh, uh, policies or or, um, or plans or activities that are actually uh, that are actually happening. Um, another important um, uh, aspect, and can we can we now advance to the next slide, please? Um, 
is um, to provide um, some to provide informal spaces um, <clears throat> and some um, to allow social interaction which helps a lot with sort of the communication between people and breaks down a lot of the barriers so this helps with the with the, the with the idea that, that, that everybody is coming there to share their knowledge and to work together and that everybody has a voice and can shape the uh, agenda of the process um, we found, and I mean, you've got examples now on the screen of the interactions that were happening in, in the early stages of learning labs in the three uh, tier one cities within um, within Fractal. So, uh, and the issues that were, were were distilled out of this, so the burning issues which uh, each city uh, agreed to focus on, um, with the um, range of experts um, in in the room um, and. So um, through this process, what you ended up with was actually um, the, the sort of creation of, um, of quite broad networks, um, people with different expertise, uh, people coming from different departments. So it really helped to break down some, some of the silos, which had, um, had been barriers to progress. Uh, so that was another um, a really positive outcome. And a lot of this was uh, an important uh, aspect of this. Um, um at the start and as we carried the process through was to have really the committed engagement of the of the fractal team the fractal team is, includes not just the project partners such as the uh ourselves at the met office and uh, the university of cape town very cross Cross climate center uh, and gilbert and um, the university there but also the other uh, partners who became part of the fractal process um, within the cities coming from the city administrations or some of the utilities and some of the other actors, some of the um, <coughs> of the, the sort of NGOs who were representing um, some of the local communities. Uh, the, uh, the committed engagement of all of these people to the process and that, that worked really well, um, not just in, in Lusaka but in all of the tier one cities and also in the other cities as well that um, which were engaged in uh, Armin Fractal. Some of the things that we found that we had to be a bit um, careful about um, was that um, as Bettina said at the beginning flexibility is very important. Um, being hyper flexible can sometimes um, give the impression that you're a bit disorganized um, and that isn't necessarily uh, um, um, conducive to people having confidence in the process. Um, <clears throat> so, so that's a, something to be uh, a bit careful about. Um, another, another aspect is, is building high expectations. Um, obviously, we're all very keen to try and help solve these, these, um, all of these, these burning issues, but we, we have to be very clear, and we had to be very clear in this process that a part of what we were doing was actually research and we were learning understanding how to um, um, how, how to um, work with these processes and how and what the difference it could make so um, we weren't solely focused just on the uh, issues in the cities that was a main focus but we were also focused on understanding how these processes could work and could make a difference so it, we had to be careful not to build too high expectations of very clear outputs which were of immediate benefit to the cities because there were other issues there are other outputs that we also had to um, be, be mindful of <coughs> um, one area which um, from time to time would um, um, would create some tension uh, was raising political issues with um, senior um, people from city administrations uh, or from government um, in in uh, in in the room <coughs> we had a couple of examples of where uh, using um, sort of um, theatre and uh, ideas like that as a way of being able to allow people to pretend to speak on behalf of senior people, help to break some of that down. But that is, that is a, an issue that you have to be a bit careful of. Um, and very linked to that is often <coughs> um, there are people with clear agendas in the room. There are people who have sort of authority over certain areas and that has to be um, acknowledged and it's important that uh, uh, that these people are, uh, are given their um, their uh, uh, um, 
um, their status is is challenged by uh, by the processes which are going on. So those are some uh, reflections on some of the uh, the positives and negatives that we uh, we found within this new Sarka process, but was also uh, was reported in the in uh, the learning lab processes in the other cities. So I'll just say a couple of things about what were the some you know, uh, impacts or outcomes from this. And again, this, this is um, reflecting very much on what you've already heard from um, Gilbert, uh, uh, bringing people together, raising awareness, um, really it, um, raising the profile um, of climate uh, within the city administrations and government. These are things that happened as a result of this learning lab process. We had uh, specific uh, climate change actions, which are, uh, um, which have have now gone into um, into planning around um, urban water infrastructure. Um, so these are some of the really positive outcomes that have uh, that have happened within the city in the institutions within the city. Um, there has there's there's now a much better network, easier interactions. Um, it's much easier and quicker to respond. To the issues as a result of uh, building those networks and breaking down those barriers, um, those silos. So that was that's been a very important outcome. Um, and those networks are now in place um, to allow this engagement to, um, to continue in um, into the future. Um, on the the climate information side, um, one of the outcomes, and Chris will speak a lot more about this in the um, in, in the final. Uh, um, talk um, is that we have been able to put together um, a series of, of clear, robust climate messages, uh, which have um, which have allowed the city to be able to incorporate those climate messages with knowledge from the city um, and the way the city works and the impacts that these that these climate outcomes will have linked to their. The, their, their consequences for people and communities um, to provide clear messages to policymakers <clears throat> on the implications of and also the potential interve interventions which allow us to respond to climate change. So I think I'll close on, on um, that point. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Richard, for these reflections. And I think. Uh, we will take a short break here and see if there are some questions. I see there are some questions in the question and answer box. Um, and I would like to maybe invite my panelists to quickly scan them and see if there's anything you'd like to add here. And the first question um, is uh, maybe that I'm going to pick um, is from Anna, Anna Steno to say, I agree with Bettina's sentiments that the participants need to decide when the learning lab process is finished, but how do you do this if funding runs out? Oh, and please don't click that it's answered while I'm still reading it. Um, and uh, basically the, the question there is, um, I think quite an important one. And, and one way I think to honestly work around it is to be quite open about your limitations, your, the way you can engage. I think it also refers to what Richard was just referring to is managing expectations. So to be realistic and to say, this is it, we have, we have funding for two years and then we need to think about in the second year how we want to take things forward and discuss with this in mind and think about um, finding solutions together. So um, this is just a little indication. It's really to be transparent and to treat this as a partnership, not as a single responsibility of the facilitators. Um, there was another question from Catherine, but I can't see it now, um, in how you deal with staff turnover. Um, and I think oh, Gilbert, Gilbert has responded to this to say, we had the challenge in Lusaka also around staff turnover, but we addressed it by having institutional support. Institutions bought into the process and when staff were rotated, we still had representation regarding this. There is a clear local um, there is a clear local face to face to the dialogue and the local university and the city authority were the lead organizers. So I think it's also really important to um, ensure that some of these things will happen and um, find ways of dealing with it, ideally also there with the group. Um, 
any of my panelists, would you like to take any of the other questions? I think we have still one from Sonia, or do you want to add to any of the previous questions? I'd just like to add, add yeah, very, very, pleasure. very briefly to your um, response to Anna, <clears throat> which is that um, having a clear thread through the Learning Lab process and having the, the facilitation team, the core team, understanding what the, the potential is and therefore helping to manage that process of, of expectations, making it clear where we're exploring and expanding out and then making it clear where we have to start to refocus back in again so that we have the the ability to um to really make a difference on something and i think so that so so this this overall understanding of the process of what the potential is is a responsibility for the core team and if they manage that well i think that helps uh, with this this particular issue great thanks richard um any any responses to Sonia's question? How to move from none in my none in my backyard discussions of problems to not in anyone's backyard movements? Any thoughts from my panelists, Chris? <laughs> I was actually going to respond to one. Oh, go for it! Go for it! Your microphone was unmuted. Go for it. Yeah, I'm still thinking about Sonia's one. It's a very interesting question, but it's um, it needs a bit of thought. Just on the, the continuity, I mean, we did some very practical things around continuity with staff turnover. Um, and I don't know, we don't have the exact statistics, but you know, in a lot of labs, roughly 50 to 60% of people had been at the previous labs. Um, so there was a fair amount of sort of churn of people um, engaged in the process. Um, but we, you know, we did processes within the lab to try and streamline new people into the process. Um, so we were quite, um, um, what's the word, explicit about doing that, um, which I think is really important. Um, and then the other one, also to Anna's one of when does the process finish? I think we've we've kind of had that situation in Lusaka where the funding has run out and there is a sense that the process needs to continue in some form. So that's been an ongoing discussion over the past year or more as to how this process will continue even when the funding is finished. I mean, it's, you know, some of it is a case of who now holds the process, where does that process sit? Um, in Lusaka, that's happening in a certain space. In other cities, it's happening elsewhere. Um, but I think that needs to be a very explicit part of the process navigation is um, how does it carry on beyond the funding? And it should, um, and it's exciting that it is, so, yeah. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we still have Sonia's question. Um, maybe I'll, I'll try can, and tackle can, it. I, oh, you want to? I can, Go for it. Well, I can, I can just uh, give an example, in fact. <clears throat> Again, coming from Lusaka, one of the issues that we were were dealing with there, or that we were interacting with, was the issue of groundwater um, <clears throat> and the groundwater supply and um, boreholes. Um, and um, there was one instance where uh, we had uh, um, an event where this was being discussed, and the deputy mayor um, was was um, was was present and giving a presentation. Uh, <clears throat> and she admitted that she herself had her own borehole within her own compound within her her own property, um, and that was a really nice way. So that the, this was being raised as an issue in informal settlements within Lusaka, but then you you immediately had this being transferred over to um, <clears throat> so to groundwater and um, groundwater extraction and boreholes this is an issue for everybody in the city this isn't just an issue which is in our focus area so so if you're inclusive with the, the, the people who are involved in the process um, then I think that that, that can that can help with these um, um, so that people feel that this is a this is a shared uh, issue that you could come up with a shared solution. I'm sure that Chris could have, will give you really good examples from the uh, city of Cape Town over the way that they manage the drought as well. And, and there are similar examples like that. <clears throat> so I think that, that. Great, thanks, Richard. Um, there's a question also here from Lizzie. 
Um, Lizzie says, my question is the limited scope of concentration of these studies. Can persons from other regions, especially the West Africa regions, participate in this lab? Um, and I want to say, Lizzie, we, we totally appreciate your interest. I think it's really important that these lab processes are quite locally grounded. So I think uh, maybe one idea might be to for you to explore to maybe engage in some of these learning lab processes within your region around specific subjects. So that'll be great. And if you would like to just know more about it, please feel free to reach out to us directly. Um, there's a question here from Miriam Serna. Miriam says, uh, the importance to know there's no plan B. Um, I'm not sure if I understand your correct question correctly, but um, maybe just to say that the amazing thing about the fractal um, process is that uh, we have always been quite responsive to challenges that we encountered and we encountered many of them um, and actually have come up with uh, plans B, C, D, E and F in many cases. So I think being flexible is important, um, but also of course, um, understanding that the issues are urgent and that we need to address them of course is uh, really important too. Good, well, I would say with this, unless any of my panelists have something to add, let's move on to another aspect that has been really a cornerstone of the um, fractal learning lab process. And this is really taking a closer look at, so how do you actually engage with climate information or climate services and how do you actually include them in these learning processes? And I think we've heard earlier from Gilbert that sometimes it takes a little bit of time before you get there. And this is because we tried to turn it upside down and first understand the issues before we would try and offer um, climate information and engage on this. And uh, I think with this, I'd like to invite Chris to give us a couple of uh, thoughts and share a couple of insights with us. And I think we need to move Great. the slides yeah. forward to Chris's uh, yes. section. Thank you. A couple of slides forward, thanks. Thanks, Bettina. Thanks for the amazing introductions. Um, Bettina, Gilbert, Richard, um, you, you've covered the process really well. You've given lots of examples. So I'm gonna dive, as Bettina says, I'm gonna dive a little bit into one of the sort of more detailed areas. I'm gonna try and keep it quite short because I'm really keen for more questions at the end. So I'll move relatively fast, um, but hopefully we can, we can keep together. Um, so the particular, the process we're talking about here is how do we bring climate information into these processes and Future Climate for Africa and Fractal was very much constructed as a, it's a project to, to enhance the urban climate resilience. So climate is obviously a very key part of the question, um, it was very explicit. Uh, a significant part of the, the funding was dedicated to, to climate science, um, so very much a climate science project even though it may not appear like it from the outside sometimes. And I think just to start off, I think we as, as the sort of climate science group within the project, we, we kind of knew, we knew how to do this um, the conventional way, which would have been engage with stakeholders, make sure you've got a diverse set of stakeholders, um, run some workshops to understand their information needs, and then we would go away and um, do science, uh, construct information, draw on existing information, um, produce a, a package, if you like, of, of climate science information that we think best inform the decisions that need to be made. And at some point later, that might take a couple of years because stuff takes time. We might reintroduce this into the case studies, um, basically present the information to decision makers and then kind of hand it over to them as to use to make decisions. And there may be a process of um, tailoring or communicating. We may engage um, specialists in those areas to try and communicate the information better, but essentially we'll be providing the best, best shot at the climate information that the city needs um, into the city space and trust that decisions can flow from there. So that would be the sort of conventional way of doing it. In fact, we really tried something different. Um, as we mentioned a few times, we, we wanted to experiment with this idea of listening, an idea of humble science and stepping back and not necessarily having climate science and the climate change message dominating the narrative, dominating the process, dominating the direction. 
So it's been really well described already how we allowed the process to emerge. We didn't arrive in the first lab saying, right, we have a plan, this is where we're going, stick with us. Um, it was very emergent. I have to say that I was very uncomfortable. The first lab had some very uncomfortable moments where it was very clear that there wasn't a plan. And obviously that makes people uncomfortable. The plan was in the process. Um, and what emerged out of that was really effective and I think has, has laid the groundwork for the success that we've had in Lusaka and the other cities. But it is an uncomfortable space. So in the first lab, as has been said, we didn't even present climate information as such. We did an interesting exercise around newspaper headlines from the future, but fundamentally we didn't present any climate information. And I think a lot of people were quite surprised at that, quite disappointed. They were expecting to be informed of what climate they needed to prepare for and to go away and do that. So that's the kind of approach that we took. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more through that. But I wanted to if you just go on to the next slide. <clears throat> Just want to make a few points before I go through some of the process details again. We are not short of information. I think there's this strong narrative out there that we just need more information. We're short of information. We need more information. And it's, it's a complex narrative. So I'm not going to say that's not true, but I'm also going to say it, it's, it's not true. <laughs> there is a lot of information. Um, so in Lusaka, some previous work had documented um, all the reports and technical notes and briefs, etc., related to water and climate in Lusaka. And come up with a database of about 159 different reports um, on this topic. There's a lot of information in there. I haven't read nearly half of them, um, but they're very detailed and complex, very rigorous um, reports. Definitely a lot of information. But most of it's not being used. Most people we engage with in Lusaka were not aware of most of that information. Um, even if they were aware of it, they weren't using it. Um, so this raises some important questions. Just go to the next slide. <clears throat> so classically, we have this problem of pose that decision makers don't have the information that they need. And the problems are described or unpacked as information is too hard to access. It's too difficult to understand or interpret. There are too many different sources, which is the right one, uh, which one do we trust? It's, and it's too uncertain. We need more precise information. And the solutions, if you go to the next slide, <clears throat> The solutions that have been proposed to this is to make it, if it's too hard to access, we make it more accessible. So we develop typically another portal or a platform for accessing information. If it's too difficult to understand or interpret, we focus a lot on communication, on visualization methods. Um, if there are too many different sources and we're not sure which one, we try and create central repositories, the definitive source of information. And this has been done many times in many countries and many contexts. Um, and if it's too uncertain and we need more precise information, then we focus a lot on reducing uncertainty. We must do more research to reduce uncertainty. And again, I'm not saying these solutions are wrong. They, are, they definitely contribute to, to solving the problem, but I think we need to dig a bit deeper um, into the problems and into these solutions. Should just go to the next slide. <clears throat> so just on the communication problem, because there's been a lot of work done on that, um, a piece of work that was done under, as part of Future Climate for Africa, um, that we led here from UCT, but was strongly, um, most of the work was done from um, by Kenny Coventry and Jordan Harold and a few others, um, looking at improved methods of communicating climate uncertainties to aid decision making. And they did an analysis of basically how uncertainty was being communicated across future climate for Africa. If you go to the next slide, they brought out a number of really key findings. I'm just highlighting two here. The first one is that communication formats should transparently convey the nature of uncertainty, uncertainty being communicated and be readily comprehensible to ensure that decisions can be made based on an understanding of the uncertainties. So really highlighting this need for transparency in conveying uncertainty. And I think that's a really important finding that we need to spend some more time on. Just next slide. And the other key one that's come out and has come up a few times already in this um, webinar and we can talk many times again, is the idea of trust. So trust in climate information and in those who communicate the information should be measured and evaluated to assess how communication and engagement activities influence trust in information. So trust has come up as a really important thing. How do you create trust? Um, is it created by authority or is it created through relationships? Um, I think there's some really interesting questions to unpack there as well. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> Isn't it about reducing uncertainty? 
Um, so there's a lot of push and it's an all very important push to continue reducing uncertainty, particularly around African climate, African climate dynamics and change into the future where there still remains a lot of uncertainty, not just around the future, but around historical climate observations and so on. The fact that uncertainty is equated with ignorance um, isn't a great starting point. So I think it's interesting when you start having these deep conversations and it kind of emerges that people associate uncertainty with ignorance. Um, and that, that doesn't help. And unpacking some of that and really interrogating it has been very helpful um, in a lot of the interactions in Fractal. Also, uncertainty should motivate engagement. When there's a lot of uncertainty about what might happen in the future, but a lot of um, evidence that things will be different in the future, even if it is uncertain, that should really motivate engagement, not dissuade engagement. And moving through that transition is really important in Fractal and in other projects. And then acknowledging that this epistemic uncertainty around, around climate change is really a small part of the total uncertainty landscape, and particularly when you're working in these complex, emerging, growing urban cities, um, that there's so many other sources of uncertainty that people are dealing with all the time. And having climate uncertainty as this massive barrier to decision-making really needs to be worked past. Uh, we, need, we need to engage with that. Okay, next slide. Isn't it about tailoring to user needs? So I think there's been a lot of very good work done on tailoring information. Um, sometimes it's captured under the idea of co-production, which is something that we've really pushed strongly in, in Fractal. Um, but various ways of, of tailoring information to what the users really need. So the answer I think is yes, but also no. I think the attempt to tailor information to user needs speaks to an underlying challenge. Um, I think we do need to be tailoring, but we also need to be really interrogating the user needs um, and connecting the information to the, to the underlying um, needs that aren't always that well um, articulated. I think we have this idea that when you arrive in a context, you meet a bunch of users, <laughs> if you like, who can articulate their climate information needs. And I don't think that's necessarily true. And it's not a, a fault of theirs. It's a fault that these are complex problems um, and we need to be bringing a lot of people into the room to understand them. And identifying user needs is a, is a complex, long process. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> so the question is, do we just keep going? So the figure on the left there is a pile of books, a pile of reports, and that's sometimes what it feels like um, with providing climate information, that we'll produce another report that goes onto the pile and that we, you know, we see them on the bookshelves behind the people we're speaking to um, when we're working in these contexts. Do we just keep going and hope that if we just build a big enough pile of information um, that somehow better decisions will be made or decisions will be made at all? Or do we do what's in the picture on the right there and what's been spoken about a lot already this afternoon? Um, do we talk? Do we get in the room together? Do we try and understand um, these problems, how we might come about with solutions, and where and if climate science can contribute to that. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> so a key thing I'll talk through very quickly, um, some of you may have heard about it already, this idea of climate risk narratives. Um, so the basic idea behind climate risk narratives is that there is, there is strong evidence in the literature um, and elsewhere that we use narratives, as human beings we use narratives to, to capture the essential meaning of complex evidence. So we construct stories that make sense of the world around us and the complexity around us. So that's our tendency when, when presented with complexity is to, to construct these narratives. And we tend to hold existing narratives and we seek evidence that confirms these and when evidence emerges that contradicts these, we might either reject the evidence or may slowly update our narratives. So the idea of the climate risk narratives is essentially to engage directly with this process of constructing narratives rather than trying to sort of beat at it from the side with evidence. Why not integrate directly with the process of evolving people's narratives? Um, so we had tried it a little bit before Fractal and it's very much evolved as part of Fractal. Um, so next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is the kind of climate evidence that you probably be familiar with, lots of complex maps and plots and so on. Um, and the idea really is to say, <clears throat> how do we go from this kind of, kind of evidence to, if you go to the next slide, thanks, to distilling relevant stories that, that make sense for people living in a particular context. So on the left, left there is one of the areas of 
through working with um, in Lusaka, working in, in Lusaka, some of the engagements there. On the right is attempts to map out futures, map out stories of what the, the city should look like into the future and all the issues that come into play there, including climate and, and many others. So this is the process of, of distilling new narratives. And this is a collaborative process. Um, so while we started it as the climate scientists, and we started the conversation, if you like, we invited everybody and we drew everybody into that process within the learning lab. So we could collaboratively come up with what are these features, what are these stories about the future um, going to be? How can we evolve our personal narratives and, and build a collective set of future narratives involving um, yeah, the climate science as well? So a key part of this is the, the distillation of the climate information. So we just go to the next slide. <clears throat> So I'm not going to go a lot into distillation itself, but um, in, in essence, distillation is identifying the essential meaning in a set of data or a set of information. And the essential meaning is obviously very contextual. So as a climate scientist, we can't say what the essential meaning of these complex plots and data are. Um, distillation has to be collaborative. It has to be in, engaged with people who are actually going to use the information. Um, so it was a deliberated process. This is Richard and I, yes, we're standing up at the front like we would classically as climate scientists, but what was happening behind us was a very engaged, deliberated, negotiated process of figuring out what these futures would look like and where climate comes into play with them. Um, it, it's a very humble process. Richard and I were very um, critical of each other's views. We, we asked a lot of questions of each other. We in, engaged other people in the assumptions that we were making. Um, it was a really interesting process and as a, as a natural scientist, um, at times a very challenging process, um, but, but really key um, to how things worked out. Okay, and the next slide is just an example. Um, this is an example of climate risk narratives kind of distilled down to an infographic form that we engage with quite a lot in Lusaka. And it looks really simple, but there's a lot of work that went behind that, and a lot of thinking, a lot of conversations and deliberations um, behind that. And the really interesting, there's a couple of really interesting things here. <laughs> the one is there was a lot of uncertainty in the climate science around future change for Lustaka, for the Kapui catchment and so on. But when it came down to it, we had to take a risk-based approach. The risk is decreasing rainfall and increasing extremes. So even though there was a diversity of messages from the climate information, that's where people focused in. As much as we tried to get people to consider other um, possible futures, people were really interested in where's the risk. And I think this is an important learning come out of Fractal. It's, we really need to frame these things in, in terms of risk rather than the climate uncertainty. Um, and the second thing is actually, despite all the uncertainty, we ended up with three different scenarios or narratives for Lusaka. A lot of the responses ended up being exactly the same. So a lot of what we could do, how we could solve these problems be, ended up being the same. So yes, we had uncertainty, but through this kind of process, we were able to in effect walk around the uncertainty um, and come up with some quite certain ways forward, which I think is quite interesting. And we're still trying to understand it, <laughs> um, but I think it's important. Okay, and last slide. <clears throat> It really is all about the process. And I hope that's come through in all these presentations. I think it has, I hope it has for, for those who've been less familiar with the process. Um, but it really is all about the process. These ideas of humble science and balancing power that Gilbert spoke um, so effectively about are really, really key. Um, we can't just pay lip service to these. Um, they're really, really important. Transparency and accessibility in the information um, is really key. And I think that's a real challenge to climate science, to be transparent, to be humble, to be accessible, to allow people to assess the value proposition in the evidence that you're presenting, to give people a tool to do that, rather than taking that power away from them. Building trust in the evidence and key to this is building trust in people. I think fundamentally people trust people, not necessarily the evidence. They'll trust the people behind the evidence. Um, these are things we need to engage in. And then surfacing values and ethics is really key. We haven't touched on that too much, um, but there's a lot that can be done there. And creating meaning from the data, that is really key. Meaning in context for people. Um, and just a quote, uh, came, many, many quotes coming out of this process um, related to people engaging with the climate risk narratives. Quote was, this is the first time I've actually understood what climate change means for my city. It was a really nice quote that came out of this process. 
So I'm going to end there. I'm five minutes over my allotted schedule, um, but hopefully we've got a bit of time for some questions now. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Chris. And the floor is open to all of you um, to answer, to ask questions. I think please feel free to use the question and answer box. Um, and I'm not sure, Suzanne, are people also able to unmute the microphone or is it just typing? Uh, unfortunately, just typing at this point. Okay. So type away if you have questions. Um, um, while you might think about your questions, I just wanted to say uh, there were a couple of comments earlier. Um, will we share the slides and uh, is there any um, additional information? So just maybe to share with everyone, we will of course share the slides. I gather they'll be on the FCFA website. Um, and of course, uh, we can also share with you on the website um, and you'll be alerted to it. I'm sure when you have uh, um, attended this webinar, maybe some additional reading um, that might inspire you to take things forward uh, in your own backyard, as it may be. And here's a question from Jan. Um, to translate uncertainty into risk for a given risk appetite, one can look at extreme scenarios at the level of risk specified. This can be done looking at risk from different scenarios and looking at the risk at given level of risk specified. Is this what you do? Chris? I think this is a question for you. It's a great, <laughs> is this what it's you a do? great question. <laughs> so I'm going to answer it with a classic fractal kind of answer is yes and no. Um, I think definitely that is something that is, is very useful to do. And we did do it explicitly like that. Um, in one case that we haven't spoken about, one piece of work we haven't spoken around. We developed um, with Rebecca Lunga at um, Oricon here in Cape Town, um, a WEEP model, which is a water resource management, water resource um, model, if you like, for the Kufuri and Lusaka water supply, including the hydropower in the Kufuri Gorge. And as using that model, we impose these high risk scenarios um, that you, you're speaking of. Um, so there, for example, we reduced rainfall by 20%, 30%, 40%, all the way down to 50% across the Kafuya catchment to see what the impact would be on the soccer water supply and on hydropower. And that was very informative because it basically emerged that even though everyone had been worried about the lack of water in the Kafuri for ex extracting water for Lusaka, even when you reduced rainfall by 50%, there was still plenty of water in the Kafuri for water supply. But obviously then, well, not obviously, but then the, the hydropower collapsed. And hydropower is essential, as Gilbert has just given an example in his presentation. Hydropower is essential to pumping and processing and distributing water in Lusaka. So that's a case where we, we took an extreme scenario, a risk kind of scenario, um, and unpacked the, the consequences of it. The climate risk narratives themselves, were, we didn't take extremes. It's been a big part of the deliberations, whether you take extremes in the risk space or whether you try and map the climate uncertainty space. And our initial thinking is coming from the climate science was to map the uncertainty space. And that's what we did. Um, I think going forward, there's been discussions about whether we should actually pull out extreme scenarios and map those out and have deliberated processes around what those mean. So I think there is scope for doing that. Um, that's why I think it's a really useful question. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. And Chris, uh, it's not quite over. Here comes another question your way. <laughs> Um, it would be from Sonia. It would be great if Chris could expand on the issue of surfacing values and ethics. What way mm -hmm. forward to explicitly address it in the city learning lab setting? Okay. Thoughts on that? I'm, I'm, I'm sure lots in the team would. <laughs> I'm sure lots in the team would have input on that. But um, I think it becomes very clear as soon as you dig a bit deeper in these processes that there are different values at play and that there are ethical consequences to those values. And I'm sure many of you, Sonia, you're probably involved in these. It sounds like you probably are. Um, so you're very aware these come up. And that's why creating, we speak about creating safe spaces is, is so important. So again, there's one picture there where we try to identify the future sort of vision. Can we come up with a shared vision for Lusaka? And that was a really interesting process because it became straight away clear that people had different values and these values were being built into very different visions of what the city should look like. So whether you're the city water engineer or you're representing the um, informal settlements, they have very different values coming into that, that space. And even external values. So 
you know, as a climate scientist, as an academic, I have certain values, you know, things that are important to me um, around the, the nature of doing science, around the need for publications, um, that kind of thing. And, and surfacing those in informal spaces in safe ways um, where people can actually express those um, is really, really important. And then to, to thrash out, well, that, what are the ethical implications of that? So, you know, if, if we push a certain set of values that has consequences for the decisions, but if the people who are gonna potentially suffer the consequences are in the same room, um, we need to be having those discussions. But again, it comes, I'm, I'm sure Bettina can reflect on this, it comes down to how do you create a space where you can actually have those conversations without causing offense, without people walking out of the room. Um, and that's, that's a very important and tricky process. Thanks, Chris. And I think uh, maybe what we could do to close this is I think we're nearly at the end of the time. Um, I would like to ask Gilbert, if you're still um, online and able to speak, I think you are, um, to share a couple of uh, just a closing comment, um, maybe around the learning lab process that you'd like to share with people to close. And Gilbert and then Chris, if you'd like to, I'll give you the opportunity to. Richard had to sign off already and um, then we'll conclude the webinar like this. Gilbert, can I hand over to you? Yes. Yeah, thank you, Bettina, and thank you to all the listeners. We appreciate the questions um, and also the time you've devoted to participate in this webinar. We really appreciate the questions raised, uh, all important, and um, we appreciate them as well. As well. My last one or two comments is just indeed is um, the lab process is is about careful leadership. It's about you know is about doing science and providing leadership in a manner that is not controlling, uh, in a manner that is not dominating, in a manner that is not predetermined. You allow for things to. Uh, you know, to unfold and for people to ask questions as they might and also to be very flexible. I agree with you, Chris, there are always issues of ethics and questions that come, come in because sometimes you may begin to think as a researcher that maybe you're not doing the science that you're trying to do. But as things unfold, you begin to see value for yourself and you begin seeing yourself stepping outside the ordinary and learning something new. Um, it's, 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 it's an interesting process uh, that is uh, uh, on the other side of things that is quite time consuming and time demanding, but extremely uh, rewarding in my view. Uh, my last point is, yeah, it's important to value everybody in the room regardless of what they bring uh, in, the, in the lab process uh, and, and to trust that uh, what people say matters to them and explore further and ask, indeed, ask critical questions, explore and critique. That's all about uh, the lab process. So I think it's been a pleasure to participate in this uh, uh, webinar and uh, it's been great input and great questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gilbert. Chris, some last thoughts? Um, just the one, <clears throat> I think it's important to touch on one of the questions has touched on that, I think, is a lot of people say, well, that's, you know, what you've done is great. It's, you know, it's super, but as, as Gil was just said, you know, it takes a huge amount of time and resources to do this. Um, so the big question that's coming at us at these days a lot is um, how do you upscale this? How do you take it to scale? How do you possibly do this at, you know, all the different contexts where these sort of decisions and processes need to happen? And the short answer is we're not really sure at the moment, but we're going into an 18 month cost of extension for Fractal where we'll be focusing in particularly on that question. And um, we'll be trialing a learning lab process in Harare that'll be trying to say, ask the question, can we do this quicker? Can we do it more resource um, efficiently? Um, so watch the space. I hope we can continue to be asking these questions and um, providing ideas. So please keep engaging with us. Right. Thanks, Chris. And uh, a concluding um, comment from my side is also to say that I think if we want to be effectively dealing with these challenges, taking a, a risk, and that can be a, a personal risk as well, 
end up participating in a process that is maybe risky or in participating in something that is less comfortable or less known or hasn't been tried before is a good way of actually letting go of some of our um, agendas, of some of our inhibitions and maybe to be more creative. I really think that uh, going forward, these processes of more collaborative dialogue that can have different forms can hopefully bring out a little bit more of our shared humanity and, and I guess also of a softness in this process. So we can really engage beyond our personal interests and beyond our sort of uh, dom predominant agendas and thinking about the bigger picture and hopefully coming up with innovative solutions. So with this, I'd like to thank you all for your participation and uh, your engagement. Please feel free to reach out to any of us um, going forward if you have any specific questions. And thank you also to South South North and FCFA for hosting this webinar. And with this, I'll hand over to you, Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you, Bettina. So we're just going to open the polling for this webinar. Just a few short questions, which it won't take you more than two minutes to answer. So we'll leave the, the polling is now should be on your screen and you can uh, vote for which option you think. <laughs> it's mostly just scales, one to five, and you just pick which one you believe uh, matches your experience of this webinar. And we use this to help us get feedback on how we're doing with these webinar series from FCFA. Thank you very much for everyone's participation. And thank you particularly to Bettina, Chris, Richard, Gilbert, and um, I think this was a fantastic webinar. I uh, really enjoyed the, the learning from, from Fractal. And uh, you gave us a, some, some real taste of some of the, the intricacies of how this, this happens in the, on the ground, and especially in Lusaka. Thank you very much for your attention. The poll will be open for about another minute or so.